It is March the 25th, 2021, and this is Curiously Polar. Hey, and welcome back. We are back with another episode. Um, we'll go to space today, right, Henry? Yes, yes, we're <laughs> going to space. <laughs> Yay, again. I again. love space talk. I'm, so, I'm such a fan of space topics. I want to I go to space one day, maybe. <laughs> Probably not, though. Um, yeah, Kirsty Polar, we have some news to start this some. off with. Some news. Yes. As usual, let's begin with uh, China. How about China? It's a great news. So maybe very, very soon we start talking not only about the polar region of planet Earth, but possibly also of the polar regions of the moon. Because what? China plans to <laughs> build a, a research station at the South Pole of the Moon. <laughs> so let's let's check the Polar Journal. They are, a, they want a, Okay, let me recap that just so I get it. <laughs> China plans a station at the lunar South Pole, is what they say. Yeah, there Whoa. are a number of of missions um, on the way where they actually collect um, samples from uh, from the Moon, and I just uh, decide to. Or just signed a um, memorandum of understanding with um, Ross, the Russian cosmodrome. Roscosmos. Uh, Roscosmos, exactly. Or Roscosmos. Um, for that mission to actually build um, a research station on the moon. They also tried to um, approach NASA, but uh, since I think 2011, um, the US have signed a a law where, the, where NASA is not allowed to cooperate with China. So mm. it's only the Russians and China cooperating here. And uh, let's see who else joins the project. Sounds so, pretty fancy. So ch a station at the Lunar South Pole means, does that mean that there will be like, there, there, there will be a station with people on it? As a, like in permanently people there? That's my understanding. Whoa. It's like a space station just uh, on that's the moon. Pretty cool. So moon I mean, it's pretty far away and... And so on. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So um, actually, you can possibly then go to the Chinese Antarctic stations to uh, train for <laughs> the uh, mission we, to moon. <laughs> at, least, at least partially, we have to. I think. I think if that really happens and this keeps coming up, we will need to change the the name of this show. I'm curiously Why? polar. It's no, a, actually, it's still, it's fits. still polar. Yeah. And then it doesn't uh, say Earth polar. <laughs> And then next up, uh, there will obviously sooner or later be uh, some some uh, people stationed at the at the polar regions of Mars, and then um, <laughs> because that's where the water is, and if they want to do what they want to do, then they, yeah. So we'll be, this is an inter interplanetary podcast. Whoever goes up first, we need to to screen the people um, <laughs> of the program to have actually a correspondent on Mars and and Moon. I actually can do a live feed from from Moon. That would be awesome. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would love the, a live a live feed from Moon. Speaking of live feed, we have another Indeed. live feed in in here, and that is from Iceland. You uh, used to live in Iceland, so tell us a bit more about what's going on there. Uh, there's an eruption going on, a volcanic eruption. So we were just thinking about that for, or we expected expecting it for for weeks when the seismic activity just build up and. Um, when quite something, and now they're actually moving the the uh, live, it's live feed. This webcam. is a live video feed from the uh, Geldingadalur. How do you pronounce that? Geldingadalur. A Geldingadalur. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Geldingadalur um, in the mountains of Fagradalsfjall. So that's a small <laughs> volcanic system in the southwest of Iceland. Are you sure? Are you sure your your throat is okay? <laughs> Sounds it's funny. Not entirely. But you see, this is just like uh, in the video right now, you can see actually the, the crater or the, the cone that formed um, where you see the lava fountains bubbling. You see some steam, this some uh, gas um, emitted, uh, just get emission, uh, emitted so, there. So, so they have an automated camera there. Uh, yeah. I think it's called a PDZ. So, so they, they have a little program running that refocuses... Uh, and zooms into different areas periodically, and it's—I mean, just—it's live. I—I I, I had the pleasure <laughs> once in my lifetime to stand 
next to a volcano, but it was uh, a volcano in Ethiopia, which was quite, well, it, it was spectacular, but it wasn't bubbling or anything, but you could see the lava and that was very, very, that was a very deep experience because you just, you realize that under us that stuff is everywhere under us if you dig deep enough uh, you will find lava so uh, and that's something you, know. you, you can experience in iceland a fairly regularly that's just one thing that happens yeah on an average of every five years and the other thing is you actually in in this case here we have a very touristic um eruption it's just something um it's a very small eruption compared to volcanic um dimensions and it's an eff uh, effusive eruption so it's lava fountains it's just um releasing lava it's no big explosions going on there's no um tremendous amount of gas you see some gas um fumes going up there so that's one of the reasons why the eruption site was closed off for uh, a few days but in fact you can visit it and since the eruption started on the 19th of march it's nearly 20,000 people who have visited that site already and just <laughs> Just get that into Volcanic your head. It's tourism. <laughs> it's amazing. 350,000 so, people living in Iceland and 20,000 of them have already visited that It's site. a it's thing just... in Iceland, I guess, um, to visit active <laughs> volcanoes. So, I mean, you, you're, sur you're surrounded by them. There is... Uh, there is um, you're living on them. You're living on them. There's, I mean, just, a, just a whole, the whole geothermal activity in Iceland is a, is a testament to that. And uh, I, I suppose from what you said is this volcano, well, first of all, it isn't big. And second of all, it's not like unexpected. So they knew no, this would yeah. erupt sooner or later. And it's not one of these, I don't know, Vesuvio or something that just explodes and makes a real mess. But this is more of a, more of a contained area. Yeah, that's the thing in, in, in that area in the southwest of Iceland and uh, along the Reykjanes Peninsula, you have... Um, a history of um, less explosive, more uh, effusive eruptions where you really have lava streams, big lava fields. When you uh, drive from Keplavik, from the international airport, into Reykjavik, you just drive through them, uh, you drive along them, you see all those moss-covered moss lava fields, and you can see how the lava is structured. It's a very yeah. special certain type of, of lava coming there, the AA lava, and you can really see how that's formed just by this eruption and i really recommend follow that live stream when it's night in iceland when you really see the <laughs> glowing lava streams right now it looks quite um boring in a way it, it looks very gray yeah. very black but in nighttime you see it's just the surface it's just a top layer of the lava that's solidified and underneath you still have the glow it's just awesome really and you know what? The times uh, when I was in Iceland, the, this drive from the airport to Reykjavik, um, which takes probably a bit under an hour, is is still one of my favorite drives because it's spectacular. You are in those lava fields and they are there with almost no end. And it's just this this moon landscape, pretty much. And usually there's not much tourism. You have the Blue Lagoon yeah. not far away from that <laughs> yes. uh, eruption site. But uh, apart from that, that's it. Oh, really? It's in that vicinity, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's down in the southwest. It's it's like in, in the triangle of um, uh, Blue Lagoon, Grindavik. And uh, if you would dry, um, yeah, draw those lines um, towards Reykjavik, they probably would meet at the uh, eruption site. A little bit further south, though. But... <laughs> It's it's ra it's closer to the Blue Lagoon than it is to Reykjavik, um, and usually that area is is widely um, neglected by tourists because it's not directly the ring road. But yeah. now this is like the tourist attraction, so it means that everybody just drives down there. And the first path to the eruption site was from the road that leads to the Blue Lagoon, so that means a three hours walk over those rocked. Oh, you lava have fields. to. You, you can't just drive up. There's no parking lot no. right next to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they actually just marked a trail a few days back. Um, mm -hmm. The the the, the uh, rescue teams just marked a trail to okay. another road, um, which goes on the south coast of the uh, Reykjanes Peninsula, and now it's only one and a half hours in one direction. But you still have to move your body actively from the car to the eruption site. So and, it's, and it's not the, really. 
a bus drive or something. <laughs> and and with the current travel restrictions, pandemic stuff, <laughs> um, Icelanders probably have this whole thing for themselves right now. Yeah, mostly, largely. Yeah, mostly. <laughs> and if you don't feel like walking, you just run the helicopter and just make a flyby. <laughs> This, this, <laughs> so, so, someone did that. Wait, wait, wait. This is the. This is uh, still on the newsreel. So, um, here is um, the. I, oh, I cannot yes. read. I cannot read this. Um, An archaeologist. This Icelandic. Okay, let, let me bring up. We have a, we have Google Translate to help us with. Uh, yeah, there. Archaeologist <laughs> rushes to the scene. So there is a, a news. What happened there? Um, there's a burial site close to the to the eruption site, and um, it's very uh, important in a way that one of the uh, of the early settlers um, pre -Christ uh, Christianity in Iceland, so prior to the year 1000, is buried in the area, and the lava stream just threatens to um, yeah, run over the burial site, and which is destroyed. So, so there's an uh, archaeological excavation site there that is in danger of getting overflown by the lava and you cannot exactly. just put a put a little fence up and tell the lava to go somewhere else that doesn't work well you can do it in a way that's what they did in the westman islands um, did they dig a when, trench for the lava to flow in or something uh in the westman islands they cooled it down with uh, seawater they pumped seawater oh. into the lava to to cool down the, and and slow down the the, the stream but i suppose and this could, only works if, uh, if if it's not like a huge stream right yeah, that certainly is not a huge stream. So that's really yeah. uh, the one so in the Western Islands was much larger. Yeah, is it easy to get seawater to that location? No, no. Uh, it's <laughs> it's 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 quite some distance. So <laughs> I think that's okay. not much. <laughs> so anyway, so one one archaeologist uh, was flown out there because it was urgent. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that was just. <laughs> Um, a newsworthy item that uh, an archaeologist from um, Minyasapman in Reykjavik just got flown um, out into the area to actually assess the situation. And I'm not even sure if they eventually um, dug out the the body and just um, yeah excavated it, or what the status is. That's just hmm. yeah, out of my knowledge at the moment. So. I guess, but, <laughs> I guess, I guess that's it for the newsreel. <laughs> no, we have so. one more, we have one more item. Oh, we do. Oh, yes, yes we do, we do, we do. Oh, oh, important, important. We go Tells down to Antarctica and join the British Antarctic Survey on their event series Extreme Antarctica, which they organise together with uh, the Cambridge University at the so-called Cambridge Festival. And it mm -hmm. starts on the 26th of March, which is uh, Friday at 11 a.m. England time. So for Central Europe, that's 12 a.m. And America, I have no idea without a time zone converter. And minus it's six, seven, eight, or nine, depending on where you live. <laughs> <laughs> or minus uh, five, six, seven, and eight from GMT. Anyway, you'll figure it out. <laughs> And it starts with uh, Professor Jane Francis, um, who is the director of the British Antarctic Survey. And um, she's available for live talk and a Q&A. And then it goes further with uh, Peter Fratwell and um, Dr. Kelly Hogan and uh, Dr. Hugh Griffith. Those are the ones who um, uh, research uh, Thwaites Glacier and Emperor Penguins and also the impact of A68A on South Georgia. When we were talking about that, mm. uh, Hugh Griffith and Peter Fratwell were my contacts at the British Antarctic Survey, where I just um, got my questions to and got um, incredible answers. So they would be um, in a talk on Saturday on the 27th of March. And then also very spectacular, uh, Captain Will Wetley um, on the 29th of March, he is the captain of the, the brand new RRS Sir David Attenborough. Brand new ship. Pretty amazing to actually get uh, a chat with a polar captain. So that's uh, also a recommendation. Just hop over, look at the website and uh, just sign up for those events. It's really, really great. Uh, is a, is a participation free? Can you watch that? Yes, it's, okay. it's free of charge. You can... Perfect. Either join the Zoom call and uh, directly interact with the um, with the guests, or watch on a YouTube uh, live stream more passively. I would say happy, happy about that. 
that's great. All right, now let's go back to space. Space. <laughs> um, outer space so close. What does that mean? Why? What are we talking about today? We're talking a bit, a bit about um, how are the polar regions um, connected to space and um, bring space a little bit closer. And that's not in a distance way, um, but more in a content way. And that all started when I started um, digging myself into polar research uh, years, years back. And then I stumbled across a podcast we both talked about um, quite some times. And that's Polar Geopolitics by uh, Eric Paglia. Yep. And in 2018, he did an amazing interview with uh, Canadian professor Mark Byers. He holds the uh, Canadian Research Chair in uh, Global Politics and International Law at the University of uh, British Columbia. And that sounds rather dry and boring, but it's not. Because his work actually focuses mainly on outer space, Arctic sovereignty, climate change, law of the sea, law of war, and uh, some internal Canadian um, uh, laws and politics. That sounds like a pretty eclectic collection of different it, interests. It, it does, <laughs> and and this episode in particular was was uh, very interesting. Um, this this episode kicked off something with me, and I really started to uh, to phenomena um, that. You are uh, actually introduced to me when we sailed in 2019 in North Norway, and it's called pareidolia. What is oh. that? Okay, pareidolia. Let me let me bring up a Wikipedia page <laughs> about that because it's it's a really interesting phenomenon. Um, it is. It has to do with perception, with how perception works, and uh, in principle, it is about us searching for patterns. So this is how the human brain works. Um, if you know the pattern of what a face looks like, you can be shown faces from other parts of the world with people who have different features, different colors, different hair, different whatever structures, bone structures, and you will still see faces because you know the pattern of a face. And this is pretty much how we make sense of everything in the world. Um, but it has a bit of a side effect because you end up seeing things <laughs> Um, seeing faces in things. So just <laughs> just look at the clouds for uh, half an hour and you will see plenty of faces because you are looking for this pattern. And, or look at um, cars. Or look at cars, of course. They, <laughs> are, they have faces. Faces are really <clears throat> kind of one of the major main patterns. And that's because we have been conditioned to look at faces from birth pretty much. Mm -hmm. So uh, some argue even that it is genetically embedded in us. And if you if you look at uh, simple examples, here's the Wikipedia page on pareidolia. Um, what we're seeing here is a circle and three lines. But of course, it's a face. There's, there's nothing that tells us this is a face um, other than the <laughs> pattern that we that we match, but it, it, it continues. There's the uh, the face on Mars, which has been in the media <laughs> decades, <laughs> decades ago. And it's a rock formation and uh, the, the shadows make it match a pattern. That's pretty much all it is. Um, here's another one with different light. But again, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not a face. It just looks like one. And there's, there's um, a pareidolia in art and pareidolia in photography. Um, just just. Google pareidolia and look at the image results. Pareidolia, P-A-R-E-I-D-O-L-I-A. -E -E and look at the photos in that, that you get back from the search. And it's hilarious in some places wh it is. Where, where we see faces. So yeah, pareidolia. But you can translate that also into other fields. Uh, so that means um, when, you, when you develop a particular interest, you will suddenly recognize more specific news on that subject. And today, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> today I remember I remember as a kid there was something going on in Baghdad. And there was Baghdad was on the news every now and then. But before right before that, as a kid, I'd seen the series Sin Sinbad the Seafarer, who's <laughs> which is in Baghdad. So all of a sudden I had this this bias towards Baghdad and I saw it everywhere every day and I hadn't really seen it anywhere before and I'm pretty sure I only noticed it because I had seen that series so 
And nowadays, algorithms support art development. They are feeding us bits and pieces according to our interests and create this kind of a bubble around us, oh, right? Yes. And so when I started being being hooked on that and um, got more and more into it, then you suddenly get more and more news about that. So, for, for example, did you know that within the U.S. State Department, a position in the legal office exists where one single lawyer is responsible for the Arctic and outer space. Really? Yes. It's the same this, person who has that. It's the same, same lawyer. The <laughs> and this Arctic person outer space. Hmm. is internally referred to as the lawyer for cold, dark, and dangerous places. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> And I mean, it, it, it does make sense. Remoteness and extreme uh, conditions clearly play um, a major role here. And by making any activity dangerous and expensive, so you can actually really put them together in, in one box, if you like. Mm -hmm. So they are creating a, um, kind of an, an incentive for, for sharing the same, uh, the same burden, if you like, right? And from here... On, you enter a rabbit hole. So what else is connected in terms of outer space and polar regions? And once you start, and everyone who ever searches something on Wikipedia knows that kind of rabbit hole thing as well. So oh, we yes. stay on the <laughs> le legal area a little longer. But when it comes to challenges for international law and governance, um, particularly of the, of the polar regions, the two superpower, uh, superpowers profited a lot from their Cold War experience in regards to to treaties around their space enterprises. So they actually negotiated a lot in uh, terms of their access to outer space. So interactions and gaps in their international legal regimes governing the use of the outer space plays a vital role for them in assessing how similar gaps might affect protection and development of the polar, uh, polar areas as well. So that's something that translates from space law into polar law, if you like. The similarities of outer space, and particularly the Arctic, is very often portrayed um, as rife with economic competition, contested um, territorial claims, and impending conflicts. However, there is a very extensive and ongoing cooperation between Russia and Western states in both areas. It's not only uh, in space, but also in the Arctic. And it seems that both have somehow three common factors, uh, the cold, dark, and dangerous character of the regions, if you like. So one is the absence of some substantial weaponization. Um, the second is the relative ease with which information about military activities may be gathered. Particularly, the weaponization has become more and more of an issue with uh, the U.S. gearing up verbally, latest since um, the former Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, um, made his notorious appearance on the Arctic Council in uh, 2019, but also with Russia reinforcing its military bases all over the Russian Arctic territory and deploying significant numbers of uh, military personnel. Are we talking about a, a new Cold War um, starting in the Arctic? Today we have a specific scientific field of research around um, that kind of contribution of uh, the space sector to the sustainable development in the polar regions. And particularly in the southern hemisphere, something unique emerged from that experience. And do you have an idea what I'm referring to? Mm, not really, but you'll tell me. It's the Antarctic Treaty System, ah. where the member states agreed for the very first time across blocks a peaceful and exclusively scientific purpose of an entire continent. This is just something completely incredible. And it hasn't repeated after that at all. So that's just something really, really unique. So the start of the International Geophysical Year in 1957 marks the intricate entanglement of, of uh, the seventh continent, um, the atmosphere and outer space. So all of those um, elements just uh, came together. The... Um, International Geophysical Year that brought together Antarctica, the high seas, the atmosphere, and outer space. So the global common subsequently defined in international law, if you like. Um, so all of they came together as new frontiers for scientific exploration. So they share 
a, a number of, of factors, a number of, uh, of interests here. And more than 67 nations participated in that um, International Geophysical Year um, across more than 4,000 research stations worldwide with a large focus of the polar uh, regions in a global corporate endeavor without any precedent. And what emerged out of that was the um, Antarctic Treaty System, which actually continued that cooperation. The success of the of this cooperation of the International Geophysical Year were not only in the advancement of science among the um, political outcomes of the IGY, were three groundbreaking legal frameworks, which six decades on still uphold like the test of time. And among them are the United Nations Convention on the high seas i think it was from the late 50s around like 50 somewhere there for the first time an international governance uh, regime for a space beyond sovereign jurisdiction if you like in a period of high intentions in the early years of the cold war the Antarctic treaty followed then in uh, 1959 laying down the principle of of the legal regime of governing scientific exploration of Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. So that's also very, very outstanding. It's not only that the number of countries just decided to put their efforts together and just really claim Antarctica as a peaceful, science, um, uh, scientific purposed continent, but also it's at the, at the peak of the Cold War. That's just really outstanding. And Importantly, is in, in the very short period between the start of the International Geophysical Year in, in 1957 and the signing of the Antarctic Treaty in 1959, it became clear how Antarctica was provided both a model and a threshold for a geographical spaces beyond uh, terrestrial inhabitation. So what happened in Antarctica builds kind of a role model for extraterrestrial um, exploration, if you like. So... The Antarctic Treaty System has since um, provided a number of lessons that are really relevant to, to governance um, for uh, other extraterrestrial spaces beyond those uh, jurisdictions, including outer space. So half a century later, both the Antarctic Treaty and the Outer Space Treaty remain exemplar uh, exemplars of a successful international relation, and more so in the case of the latter, which un unlocked outer space. As scientists have put it, as a province and heritage of, of humankind. But that's not the only connection of the polar regions and, and outer space. Antarctica is, is kind of the closest you can get to space without ev uh, leaving Earth, right? It's very, very isolated. It's uh, confined. It has an extreme environment where the expeditioners live remotely for up to nine months of the year. So today... Space agencies from around the world send their people to Antarctica to actually test the human factor in almost total isolation. The human mission to Mars may still be um, some time away. I've seen um, some sketches for Mars missions in, in, in uh, 54. Um, that's going to be very exciting. But scientists... Um, are already preparing that, and they they are all aware that the the many hazards that must be overcome um, to make that dream become a reality. So they actually use the the surroundings, the setting of an Antarctica, to prepare for that, to use it as a training facility, if you like. So one particular cause of concern, of course, is the potential for uh, physiological and psychological problems that could arise from the conditions. <laughs> Isolation of, is exactly a bit of a problem, yeah. It's a big problem. And what space agencies understood is that you have those same problems on the research stations up on the ice sheet, far, far away from everything else, completely off the grid for up to nine months. So you really have to prepare people. So mm. the space agencies went to, to the uh, Antarctic programs and really... Um, brought in their uh, manpower and profited a lot from the experience and expertise of the Antarctic programs. 
uh, in the Antarctic, you, you can at least go outside if you want, but if you're up on Mars, I guess that's not an option. So that's exactly <laughs> that's ac exactly the thing. So you have some sort of amenities you don't find on Mars yeah. or in a spacecraft. So you have a seasonal possibility to leave your research station, to go outside, to take a fresh bre uh, breather. But testing the mental impact of total isolation is crucial for those um, oh, yes. long term space mission obviously so the closest you can get you very likely will find in Antarctica and apart from that it's only um, on the ISS maybe yeah that's also um, one of the testing grounds by the way yes where they really uh, see also how does um, zero gravity affect your body how um, can you actually really deal after half a year of traveling in zero gravity uh, how is your body uh, coping with um, entering atmosphere again. So there's a lot of tests going on. Yeah, I've just recently seen, um, what was it? A, a thing about astronauts coming back from the ISS uh, or to the Earth and they can't walk because they, the, the body just very quickly loses that capability. Um, and it's, more, it's, it's mostly to do with the balance system in our ear. And uh, it kind of needs to retrain. Uh, and it, it, it might take months for them to be fully back to... Uh, to how they were before. So yeah, and a, and a trip to Mars, we're talking months. Yeah, so, half a year, like six six yep. months of traveling. And, in, in the in shortest case. Uh, possible <laughs> case, yes. So um, that's a pretty long time out there with all the uh, weightlessness and the radiation. <laughs> so, hmm. But the space but agencies are there. not... Exactly, but they will, will not only or they're not only testing the human factor on Antarctica, they also test equipment like, uh, for example, robots or space vehicles. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, there are uh, large tests of robots to uh, which which are supposed to be deployed to um, Europa, the icy moon of uh, Jupiter. So the scientists, they simulate their research projects on the East Antarctic ice sheet, drilling holes three kilometers into the ice to reach like the largest subglacial lake, uh, Vostok, to see if and how their project might be realized on that moon. So there are a number of programs really facilitating the specialty we have there. And the science um, on Lake Vostok has just proven that life is possible in a lake that's cut off everything else for millions of years. And that's something completely mind-blowing. And I'm sure we're going to talk about Lake Vostok in a, in a single episode one day. But just imagine it's a lake covered by three kilometers of ice being off the grid for millions of years. And scientists drilled a hole into the ice, got water samples, and they found life forms in the water. I hadn't thought incredible. about Europa, but of course it is a, it's a, it's an icy moon. And, uh, and it's supposed to have a liquid ocean underneath. Yes. So, so the Antarctic is, a, is of course, a, a, the best training ground we have for that. Of course. Interesting. And last but not least, when we talk about the connection of outer space and the polar regions, did you know that Antarctica is probably the best place on Earth to hunt for meteorites? Hmm. Let me think. Why do you think easy, they should be easy to find? Because everything's white and they are not white. Is that the case? It's one of the yes. cases. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, other is... A stab in the dark, but yeah, okay. <laughs> the other, the other is um, you have basically a, a very equal um, probability of finding meteorites um, on land, so they are um, distributed very equally over over the planet. Mm -hmm. But you have big weatherings, uh, weathering impacts all over the planet, except in the um, most remote and most hostile environments where you have pretty much uh, no corrosion. Um, and that's actually very often uh, deserts. So Antarctica being the coldest cold desert on the planet um, just offers the best um, playground for that. So you don't have humidity that goes into the rocks. You don't have um, very much any other form from, uh, of corrosion because very, very quickly after a meteorite um, landing uh, on the ice sheet will be just covered in snow. So it will be very much isolated. And then you have, of course, the motion of 
um, of the ice. And if you just um, pop up the second um, media we've prepared, the uh, cross section of Antarctica, then you see there is. Uh, it looks like a like a slice through cake, and you see that Antarctica has a very interesting relief. So you have a high peak in the ice, and from there, that's what's what's called the ice divide, and from there it flows towards the coastal areas, or in that case, in East Antarctica, largely towards the Transantarctic Mountains, because the Transantarctic Mountains lay actually lower than the highest point of the East Antarctic Ice Sheet. That means that all the meteorites in that area, that, that land in that area, will be transported over time towards the east, uh, to, um, towards the Transantarctic Mountains. And on the Transantarctic Mountains, we have a phenomena that's called uh, blue ice areas, where you have all ice being dwelled up onto the mountain uh, ranges and just completely um, undisclosed, if you like. So scientists, particularly from McMurdo Station and from the um, uh, from the Scott Station, from New Zealand and the US, they actually go to the Transantarctic Mountains to collect meteorites there, which just got washed out in a way like um, yeah, just like the swell on the beach. It's the the effect pretty much the same. So they just got washed out here, have very little corrosion, so you actually get the best quality of meteorites down there in Antarctica. There is a department within the um, U.S. Antarctic program which is only dedicated to search for meteorites. That's amazing. So, 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 how do they search for them? Because when when they land and then are covered in snow, you can't see them probably. So, um, is that mainly done with magnetic uh, surveying, or what do they do? No, that's the motion of the of the glacier. So, the glacier comes from down from the ice divide because that's much yes. much higher than at the Transantarctic Mountains. So, it's um, it's and captured in the ice. The ice uh, moves forward, and at the Transantarctic Mountain. Mountains, you have kind of an updwelling. So the older ice from the bottom will just be, um, is just rising up to the surface. Oh, and so they that, just fall out of the ice pretty much? Exactly. They're just <laughs> deposited. That's amazing. Exactly. That's, that's why amazing. the Trans Antarctic Mountains, and that's where they are built for, for meteorites. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the perfect like term. And when you put up the, the, the other map um, from the, uh, the, the Rima map of Antarctica, yes. which is like, the most detailed map of Antarctica is um, an elevation um, model map of Antarctica. That's interesting. And you see the Transantarctic Mountains, which are, um, you're starting at the, at the bottom, um, go around the Ross Sea, and then find a continuation in the um, Antarctic Peninsula, and particularly the area around the Ross Sea. That's actually where the um, the ice coming from the ice divide on the eastern Arctic ice sheet, the big patch of ice um, on the uh, your upper left of Antarctica, the, the, the biggest part of Antarctica, is moving towards the Transantarctic Mountains. So that's a na it's a natural barrier here where the ice is just depositing through that updwelling those meteorites. So the scientists. It sounds hilarious, but basically go there and collect them. You don't have to dig for them. And that's, that's great. That's a, a very special feature that connects again the polar regions to outer space. And more than 20,000 uh, 20, samples of rock have been uh, collected from unknown sources since 1969. And that's when all of that started. Uh, when a Japanese expedition found the very first concentration site um, of um, meteorites in Antarctica in the Yamato ice field. And that's just really one of the most amazing stories I heard about Antarctica. So just you, going to so, Antarctica to collect meteorites. <laughs> so you just you just walk there and you stumble across a heap, a pile of a pile of meteorites. Uh. And based based on the findings in Antarctica, uh, scientists are actually um, providing an estimate of the amount of space rock falling on Earth each year. What do you think? How much is that in kilogram? Oh, it must be many tons, right? So w w most of the meteorites that land on Earth are somewhere between five gram and a few kilogram. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there must and, be thousands and thousands of them. And the overall amount is estimated to access somewhere around 16,000 kilograms. Yeah. There we go. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I thought about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it, but most of them aren't found because they land somewhere either in either in the ocean, which covers two thirds of the globe of our globe, or in remote areas. And so, yeah, <laughs> it's very cool, very very cool. So, so you find there is a Antarctica close if you want to find meteorites. Exactly. So you see, there's there's a very close connection between the polar regions and space in many dimensions, in many ways, and probably even more. And we haven't even tackled them yet. But I just started with that legal base where I was just completely baffled by that fact that there's one person responsible for the Arctic and <laughs> space, obviously. Makes totally sense in the very first place. <laughs> well, does it really? I mean, if if I, if I look at okay, so let me talk about German politics for just a second. Very. <laughs> <laughs> our, our secretary of of traffic and transportation in Germany um, for a few years now has be, ha has been given a second responsibility, which is digital infrastructure, because it is transportation, right? So. It's not going so well, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> but you have to think uh, a few uh, decades back. So just just imagine uh, the 50s, where the polar regions were largely inaccessible. So the Arctic areas were just largely inaccessible for most of the year. There was no possibility really to go any further except for nuclear icebreakers, which the US obviously don't have. So... In that case, it makes sense. It's a, it's both define, defining areas, both the Arctic and outer space, where you can travel with a significant investment in both money, technology, and last but not least, human life, human effort. Oh, I mean, I mean, it also does make sense. I, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm just making jokes <laughs> about sure. the German. <laughs> But, I mean, the people who are in charge of the Autobahn are also in charge of the data Autobahn. So, sure. <laughs> <laughs> wow, but this is this is cool stuff. So, we have uh, the link is done between outer space and maybe even Mars and Europa and the Antarctic. How cool is that? How cool is it's that? Pretty awesome. Ah, so let's um, let's come back in a week from now with more cool stuff because I think our newsreel is really taking off. And uh, we are, of <laughs> course, online at Curiously Polar on the social media. We are at CuriouslyPolar.com. That's our website. You can find all the episodes there. And uh, we're going to bring you more crazy things. I hope. I hope. I'm... I'm I've, I have very high I'm hopes very with certain. you, Henry. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for bringing us all this really cool and amazing stuff. Mm -hmm.